Hello and welcome to this podcast. My name is Nicoletta Lambertucci and I'm the contemporary art curator at The Box. I curated the exhibition Cahin de Wiley, Ship of Fools, which opened at the Arts Institute on the 29th of September 2020. The exhibition takes as a starting point an acquisition made by The Box in 2018, thanks to the Contemporary Art Society Collections Fund at Fries. For centuries, art has usually served to recognize, reflect and reinforce the reputations and the stories of those who hold it. Think of all those portraits of king on horseback, politicians posing, the great and the good, and usually the white and the male. Hinda Wiley seeks to reroute this current of power, to turn the traditional tropes of the canon back on themselves in the service of those who are marginalized, ordinary or unheard. Often in his work, Wiley casts unknown black sitters from the street to take the place of emperors, warriors and men of industry. For this podcast, I invited Dominic White to join the conversation and to discuss her practice and her fascinating research on nautical narratives, Afro-pessimism and the Black diaspora. Dominic is currently based in Marseille, France. She studied fine art at Goldsmiths in London and she has had shows internationally and also in the UK. Currently, she's part of Possédé, the exhibition at Moco in Montpellier, and Mia Skin at CAPC Bordeaux. Thank you, Dominic, for accepting this invitation. I would like to ask you, Dominic, to say a few, very briefly, a few words about what you're currently working on now, if there is an, something you are reading or like um, what's your current research at the moment. Um, so right now, yeah, it's uh, an extension of like the body of research that I've been doing for a couple of years titled The Shipwrecked. Um, but I'm kind of delving more into, um, I think, yeah, you've noticed this, delving more into kind of battle flags or remnants of war, as particularly at sea. Um, so I'm very interested in uh, riots on slave ships, also pirates, a um, little bit of hierarchy, but from below, uh, I'm very interested in like this kind of dismantling of the state via the sea as opposed to like a building of the state via the sea. Um, yeah, I'm very into uh, yeah flipping the power, flipping the power dynamic. Um, yeah, sure. in fact, you know, like I, I think one of the reasons why I thought um, having a conversation with you around those themes would have been particularly interesting because it's really like I feel that your research is very complementary to some of the themes that are very present in the exhibition. I mean, in a way, I thought, you know, the kind of strategy uh, within Wiley's work is very much one of a translation, of mm -hmm. a trans translation, not translation, sorry, <laughs> translation, like just using, you know, same scheme or like um, the same format or visual format, but changing the subject that is depicted in the mm. action or like, you know, using, using, um, e extracting power from something that is existing already, you know, so yeah. using the conventional ways that power is depicted and just changing the subject that is depicted rather than being a white person, it would be a black figure, but Whilst with what I was really um, uh, looking or seeing, at least in your work or in your strategy more than in your work, is, is more of a transformational one, like looking at uh, nautical myth and the black diaspora more in a reflect, like a, I love that you say on your website that you use like shipwrecked as a reflexive verb, as a state of being. Mm -hmm. So this idea of um, annihilation, destruction, decay. So really, rather than using existing um, sort of place of power, you actually use the opposite. And, yes. and, and your research really is positioned on, the, on, the, on that side rather than on 
the known side, you know, is more positioned on the unknown. So hence, perhaps, the water as really a good location because it's certainly not a land. It is considered this sort of fluid uh, state. But I mean, I don't think it's even, well, when we say state with like a capital F, because I think it's uh, impossible to own the sea. It's impossible to know everything about it. Like, and it's quite terrifying, but kind of uh, freeing at the same time. Um, and for, for me, the sea is a rejection of like everything that the land embodies, you know, it, its borders, its... Um, its identity, it's like it's perpetuating the system of like both capitalism and black social death, because I think that is the only system that has been built to exist on land so far. And it's a dismantling of that for sure, um, which is why yeah, I guess I, I don't want to borrow the language that has already existed before. You know, I don't want to put blackness or black people in the position of power or in the position of whiteness because I don't really to me, I don't really know what that does, mm. um, because yeah. it's like if, if you're just feeding back into the same system, that, yeah. <laughs> no, no, I, I understand, of course, I understand the point. But so can you perhaps, because I, 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 I have to admit, I'm really in love with the kind of language that you use. It, it feels very, very so precise and pondered so on your website sorry i keep referring to your website <laughs> like a little nerd but, um, <laughs> you also use the term hierarchy uh -huh. which i have to admit uh i had to research because i didn't even know it before and it's it's the most interesting because it's very complex it means loads of different things but mm -hmm. um so obviously um the box is is the museum in plymouth which is the largest military port in Western Europe and the idea of maritime society and sort of um, military aesthetic in relation to the sea is, is very present and, mm -hmm. you know, we have a really, really large uh, maritime collection and artefacts. In fact, you will see in the new museum, the first thing that you encounter when you enter are those gigantic figureheads so you have these huge figureheads that um so it, it's immediate immediately obvious what is that you are entering or the kind of like they are used obviously as a decorative um element but they are an incredibly important sort of cultural heritage piece of work uh, that really tells a lot about um you know, the, the sort of mythology of traveling through um, uh, through sea, really. Um, but what I wanted to ask you is, yeah, so what is what is your relationship with maritime society and how do you use this term hierarchy? I know it's only recent that you are in Marseille, but I thought it was quite <laughs> fitting that you also are <laughs> by the sea. And obviously Marseille has been um, from... Uh, a literary point of view, an artistic point of view, a very important, the, the, the idea of the port and what arrives from the sea uh, has been quite uh, an important one, uh, especially in that, in that city. Um, yeah, I mean, for, for starters, uh, my idea of hierarchy came from the book, uh, The Many-Headed Hydra, mm -hmm. uh, in which, uh, I think I mentioned to you, in which yeah. hierarchy is described, as I said before, as uh, creating power on land via the sea. So essentially, uh, in terms of this book, th this is how the slave trade therefore created modern day capitalism, essentially. Um, and what I'm interested in is the hierarchy that existed like from below. So everything that undermines uh, that sense of hierarchy or that sense of capitalism at sea. So I'm talking about everyone such as like, you know, the pirates who for many years, uh, yeah, disrupted the slave trade, which I thought was so interesting because as we've sp spoken about before, how, how pirates are essentially spoken about in such a bad light in popular culture for that reason. Um, mm -hmm. But also like, uh, yeah, like, uh, uh, like things like the obo landing, I'm very interested in when it comes to like resistance in the sea or, or, or even just like revolts on ships. Um, and in the modern day, I'm kind of interested in, a, uh, what do you call it, like flag of, 
Uh, what is it called? <laughs> flag of... It's kind of like, well, there's, there's a term called flagging out, um, which um, essentially means that a, a vessel uh, no, no longer belongs to anyone. So it's essentially kind of, yeah, <laughs> floating oh, at yeah. sea. But basically, yeah. like when you, when you register a vessel, you register it to a certain country and it doesn't have to be the country that a vessel comes from. Of course, um, yes. So, but essentially when, uh, when you do that so many times in order to, I don't know, avoid tax or av avoid the law, uh, you end up, you can accidentally be deleted from all registers. And it, it does happen, like there's like a couple of like uh, fishing boats that are kind of just stuck. <laughs> it's really quite bizarre. Yeah, you kind of just, and I don't really know what happens then if someone can then claim ownership and then do what they want. So I don't, I kind of am um, into this like kind of, yeah, fluidity of power at sea and how even now there, there isn't like this, as I said before, like this complete ownership of, or like borders in the water. I think it's, mm. it's near impossible. Um, so I guess that's my relationship to uh, maritime, yeah, yeah. maritime kind of society or uh, histories or what that means. Yeah, it's about like- Yeah, and pirates are certainly like, <laughs> the community of the stranded or the, like you know those ones that are at sea without yeah yeah, yeah for but sure also that they chose to essentially be stateless i'm talking about like the og kind of pirates from like <laughs> the 1600s and 1700s they were stateless uh kind of not when we say lawless it kind of sounds like you know cowboys kind of thing but like they created their own microcosms on board of these ships that didn't derive from the Americas or from European laws. It was like they pretty much, yeah, <laughs> created their own space at sea. I think that's why, yeah, I have such an interest. Because it's like, even when I speak about like a, you know, like my practice is rooted in, I, I guess, like seeking like an alternative future mm. or an alternative world. But like, I'm sure not everyone who identifies with blackness or who is black uh shares that view of course not like you know it's not a monolithic uh, approach nor identity mm. um i mean i was just thinking about this actually before this call like you know that whole idea of post-blackness is something i can't get my head around because i don't know it, it's just like more segregation and i, I don't really know who it's for kind of thing like it, it's a uh, a complex thing so, so like yeah when I, when I speak of creating a new community or like the sea as the outside or like trying to imagine beyond everything that is tangible uh yeah I mean I, I guess it's not for everyone and I'm not doing it to I'm not doing it in yeah for emancipation or like I don't know like this kind of utopia where we hold hands because I, I don't think that's possible either well, which brings me back to this idea of um, um, what is pessimism and what is the opposite of it. So I really like, I mean, so just briefly, because perhaps, um, so Afro-pessimism is a, is a critical framework and obviously mm -hmm. you can, it's been very much part of your research. So I'll, I'll let you speak a little bit more <laughs> about that and how that re relates to your practice. But very briefly, it's a critical framework that describes sort of ongoing effects of racism and colonial colonialism, historical process of enslavement and what is the impact of this kind of things on structural conditions. So on, on personal, subjective, but also, um, you know, com, com, uh, communal conditions. So conditions of, co you know, large communities of people. Um, and you have been using this framework um, a lot, which, you know, in a way you were that's what you were talking about now, I guess, but just to make it a little bit more clear. <laughs> yeah, to, to root it in something, I guess. Yeah, but, uh, yeah. But it's like, uh, so to me, Afro-pessimism is, is like bigger than my own practice because it's something oh, yeah, yeah, that I, get, yeah. I, I guess, like believed in before I knew what the framework even was. Um, <laughs> you yes, know, like, and, yes. and I think reading theory has just basically uh, given framework to something that 
I don't know, like already existed within my own family, for example, just didn't have the words for it. Like, uh, yeah, I think theory just, yeah, gives words to lived experience. Yeah. But um, yeah, like for me, it's just like, uh, this is why I think I tapped on like post-blackness as well, because it's like for, in regards to blackness and black people, uh, I think within the system, like, that there is no like redemption. There is no like, in the words of like, well, paraphrasing Joy James, it's like black death is essential to capitalism and to democracy. So like in order for black death to not occur, like whether that's social or physical, the whole system would have to collapse is a kind of thing. But, you know, like for example, like this year, I really thought we were on a teetering of like it collapsing or like starting to undo itself. But now in December, I'm not so sure. <laughs> like, like, Wait, like it, what way? Uh, I never thought in my life I would get to watch like statues of slave owners be toppled into the sea, to to watch like global race riots happen. I never ever thought in my lifetime that would ever happen. And I think in, in a lot, I think a lot of people also, a lot of black people also felt the same. And it really, it, I don't know, part of me was like, maybe this is the shred of hope that I've kind of always had in my practice and my outlook that maybe it's not all going to go to shit. Like there is a way out of this. But now, kind of like six months on, now it's simmered down. Now, you know, there's no like huge calls for, I mean, not even defunding the police or re like reform. I'm talking about like pure abolition. I'm talking like... That it really felt like there was a moment when like people were like, no, this system, it's not even broken. Like this, this is how the system works and it needs to go. Whereas now I just feel like, I don't know, especially with like the US elections, I'm like, great. Like <laughs> we have Kamala Harris, woo, like a woman of color who's still gonna put me in prison, who's still gonna like, <laughs> you know, endorse the police system. It's just like, for me, it feels like there's no, way out and it's like a continuous cycle and I remember having that conversation with my dad who was like I had to live through like you know the 60s and 70s and I had to live through Thatcher and I'm like yeah like <laughs> and I'm living through 15 years of the Tories and Brexit and like Windrush and like all of this and I remember just watching his face kind of not drop but like kind of like the realization that oh like this just kind of mutates and just looks slightly different every generation mm. And that, uh, yeah, <laughs> kind of. No, no, that's absurd. I am very interested in this idea of the mutation, in fact. It brings hmm. me back to what I was saying about, like, uh, the way words change their meaning. I think it's a very similar sort of process, you know, like things just uh, transform themselves. It's like, uh, it's very subtle. It's very, it's very subtle, but it's, it's, it's incredibly uh, profound it, it, it's really like as you said before like th this lived experience it's an embodied reality that then suddenly becomes words but then these words over time they change as yeah. um, sort of structures and behaviors change um, I I you know with with um, in the Wiley's uh, video, but also with the paintings, there is always this kind of surface of pleasure with these very beautiful colors, these very like beautiful people, and everything is so appealing about about it. You know, about not just about the paintings, but also about the past. And as we and, and as we said before, like those are really borrowed from like kind of like. Uh, really well-known classical mode of depicting power but on the video is it's still like so pleasing you know mm -hmm. even though the kind of subject and the voiceover is really really sort of dramatic terrifying uh, actually when you look at when you look at this work you are so pleased by it so somehow there is a kind of um, there is a conflict in me every time I look at his work and I feel it's a positive conflict you know because there is uh, in a way I'm totally drawn to it in another way I'm completely like you know it's that it's that kind of um, 
pleasure of looking at something that is painful somehow um, and that you feel almost you almost feel guilty about looking at certain things uh, but it's so beautiful and I think that that's obviously part of the broader strategy whilst with your work it's very much about like create like looking at those scars you know you have this this um almost dead bodies that mm -hmm. are you know that you just put so blunt but you know in, in front of of the audience you just cannot escape but at the same time they're so beautiful <laughs> <laughs> um but you know like uh, I don't know. I just wonder whether you think about this idea of beauty whilst mm -hmm. making a work that is very much about pain, and and you know, you sp even by reading some of the titles of your work, you know, uh, there is sinking, there is prisons, there is you know, like uh, I don't know. Uh, th there is a lot of of pain uh, in there I don't know how you how you approach that sort of more uh, in a way it's the, the the aesthetical part right that mm -hmm. it's obviously like uh, it, you cannot not take into account when you're a visual artist which is true um, I mean I don't think it's something that I like explicitly like think about when I'm making Mm. I think it's like a byproduct of perhaps uh, the materials that I use. I wouldn't even say the processes that I use because the process is such like a demanding and violent thing. It's not, I mean, it's quite funny on the rare occasion when someone gets to like kind of like watch me work when I'm like installing or something, they're always shocked that I, I have such a heavy hand with the works, that it's not this kind of like dainty kind of ritual. It's this... Uh, mm yeah it, it's like almost like fighting the work as well like some of them so tell maybe heavy. let's explain a little bit so how do you work you use mostly found material right but then you rework them uh, mm -hmm. uh, in your studio and where where do you go and and look for your materials um it well, depends where i am it depends where i'm making <laughs> so like when i was in london the only way that i could source a lot of materials was either it was mostly through the internet so whether that yeah. was through like auction houses or whether that was like making a connection with like a sailing school or something but when i've worked next to the sea such as in marseille or when i was in sicily last year um it's a lot easier to just yeah literally walk around and um yeah like yeah take take items even from like yeah the sea or the port or um these things i like but i prefer things to have like an existing life um because at the same time i could i could buy sal fabric brand brand new for example um I, I always want to pick like the most used or like actually unusable items um yes. that i then rework yeah um, and how do you rework it a mixture of like power tools or even just shredding it by hand <laughs> it's quite it's, I mean it's quite wow. like a bizarre uh process because yeah I think everyone expects it to be like a dainty thing where you know it's like a slash or something but no it's like I will pin it to a wall and kind of tug it and tear it and then do the same with the clay to be honest it's you know, it's such a delicate uh, material, but, you know, casting with it or even throwing it or the amount of times that I've purposely cut uh, sculptures like that have been hanging from the ceiling or, yeah, <laughs> it's quite a, um, I think, surprising process. But, yeah, that's how things work in my studio. Yeah, and you've been, I mean, we've touched upon this a little bit earlier, but you've used a lot um, flags in your work mm -hmm. and can you just maybe tell a little bit more about that so obviously it, it goes back to what we were saying before about this idea of the state or the stateless community mm -hmm. and the sort of you know the, the promised land but obviously there is a lot more in there and the fact that you take something that is existing and rework that 
uh, in your studio, it really adds some kind of personal history in, in you know, you, you weave personal history into something that already has a history, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I guess it's because it's like, I feel uh, quite detached to like belonging to a state. I mean, like, uh, like families Windrush, like from the Caribbean. And it's like, I have a British passport, but I also feel rejected from that state. So then it's like kind of, it's not about ownership. Ownership is the wrong word, but I guess like belonging is some, yeah, somewhat like maybe what I'm like edging towards. Mm -hmm. And maybe that's why the flags, I mean, uh, I've only just started like a new body of work that uh, are more explicitly flags. Well, kind of <laughs> I mean, flags in my kind of definition um but even then it's like they have like a similar visual vocab but it's not like you know it's not like the british kind of flag it's not like the french flag where it's like you know there's a very particular um like criteria that has to be filled in order for it to be a french flag in order for it to be the american flag um i think it's more of like a it's, it's not like I, I'm creating like a new state either. That, I think that's why it's so unrecognisable and it doesn't follow like any rules. Um, I kind of have taken it as like a, as we spoke about in the beginning, like a reverse of, a, you know, planting your flag and saying, you know, this plot of land belongs to England, this plot of land belongs to America. It's like this undoing of that, I guess. Um, yeah, I feel, I feel like the works that have happened this year and will continue to happen next year have kind of um, moved on from this idea of uh, like escape. And now it's more about actually, you know, this is I'm, I'm warning you or like this is a threat. Like this is this is the future that <laughs> I'm envisaging it uh, at to be. And there's only one way of getting that and that is through the destruction of the state, essentially. Mm. Yeah, I love that in, in the way you sp the way you speak. It's so violent. It's as if like the only way out of this. It's like yeah. I don't mean physical violence, of course, but <laughs> I mean I do. But <laughs> no, but is it not? But that, I mean no, but uh, I think um, that that is what that is what I find really unique in in what you do because there is a lot of violence there that is not hidden, and I think it's very very um, courageous and powerful, and um, I don't know it made it made me think and I already told you this before but it, it made me think a lot about this idea of victory and defeat and I really mm. wanted to ask you what what these words mean to you in relation to your practice because when there is violence when there is that kind of charging or challenging um, inevitably we have to we are confronted with this idea of the winner and the loser and and I mean how do you see that working out or not <laughs> working out? Uh, <laughs> I think I think when I when I've like um uh, use victory and defeat in particularly in the titles of works uh, mm -hmm. I think it, it means like a couple of things first of all it depends on who actually in terms of the work who who is the holder of this work who is the owner of this work so maybe at the moment that I'm in possession of this work for me it, it's representational of like a defeat of the state and a victory because this this like object this splayed object on this uh I don't know what you call them in English, but uh, basically like the, 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 the metal object is akin to uh, what you use for skinning animals, essentially. So like uh, it, it's like th this is like a trophy to uh, say that we did it, like we escaped, essentially, like we've, we've escaped uh, not, not blackness, but I guess like it, it escaped the, the, the future of like death, essentially. But <laughs> again like if someone else then owns that subject uh, owns that object sorry then it's kind of reverse if that makes sense you know when we talk about you know these dead bodies and like how how the gaze uh therefore is, is like you know it changes how that body is th therefore viewed or how that you know is consumed kind of thing 
yeah. I don't know if that answers uh, <laughs> your question at all. Well, as I hoped and expected, it doesn't answer. It makes it <laughs> way more complex. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like, obviously, you know, when... Um, when confronted with these kind of issues, <laughs> you can't really answer. But certainly, it's uh, there is a lot of food for thought. Thank you so much. Um, <laughs> perhaps now we can just um, uh, move towards a conclusion. Where I would just like to ask you: uh, What are your future projects? And what you're working on now in the studio? Uh, well. <laughs> quite a chaotic 2021 that's what I'm working towards yeah um so yeah I'm working towards uh six shows seven oh. shows I don't know one of them <laughs> I don't know <laughs> maybe we'll see if I'm still like you know alive and energetic in December next year but uh yeah continuing um I guess like three threads of uh, like bodies of work. So of course, like the shipwreck is like the big one that everything kind of falls under, but yeah, moving into, uh, yeah, uh, like flag work. I've kind of think I've named that series like flagged out and I've remembered what the term is. It's called flag of convenience, um, which refers to yeah. what we were talking about earlier. Um, and then like a, a continuation of uh, I guess like this melting or this like escaping forms from a um, like you know like what I've been doing in, mostly in 2019 like uh, the shipwrecked form I guess like falling or escaping from uh, their metal iron captors kind of mm -hmm. thing. Yes, yeah. Um, and then yeah, <laughs> trying to develop uh, written work alongside it all. I I would love to have you down to Plymouth and, and visit the museum and the shows and look at the sea together, look at the horizon yeah. together. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I would love to come down and um, I'll obviously let you know when I'm back in the UK for sure. That's fantastic. Well, Dominic, thank you so much uh, for your time and for being so generous. Of and course. yeah, good luck. And <laughs> Well, lovely is not really the right word. Wishing you a very good. <laughs> <laughs> Bye, thank you. Bye, love. Bye.